everyone. And welcome to Lunch and Lawn. So during this session, um, all participants will be muted. And so I ask you now to look and mute yourself. And this will help the eliminate that unwelcome background noise and also the echo that sometimes occurs. So this Lunch and Lawn program today is sponsored by the Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association, which operates under the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Master Gardeners share science-based information about gardening and horticultural topics. Today's session is the third of six to talk with you about lawns and weeds. My name is Gardener Ann, and I'm joined here on today's panel by gardeners Linda and Miriam. Our program today is divided into three parts. First, an introductory topic, and today we're going to talk about selecting turf grass for our Northern Virginia yards. The second, we're going to talk about two weeds of the week, and finally, our panelists will discuss your lawn questions that you submitted during registration. So I'm Ann Mason with the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Today, in our third luncheon lawn, I'm going to discuss selecting turf grass for our Northern Virginia law yards. Now, not long ago, I stood in front of the turf grass seeds offerings in my favorite garden center, and I just boggled my mind and say, what should I select for my yard? Well, today I'm offering you some insights and we hope this will help you as you make your decisions a little easier. I'm going to cover turf grasses for sun, which means six hours or more, and briefly discuss the options if you have less sun. Now, we in the Northern Virginia live in a transition zone. So selecting the turf grass for our mid-Atlantic yards is a little bit challenging. Virginia lies in the southern end of the cool season grasses and the northern end of the warm season grasses. So we can grow both types of grasses, but they're at their boundaries. And as our climate shifts, we may see these boundaries shifting northward. And since we can grow both types, your option really depends upon what you want to look your yard to look like. So in the Piedmont region of our Northern Virginia, um, most of our area lies in the United States Department of Agriculture hardiness zone 7A. And we have pockets of the cooler zone 6B in Eastern Loudoun County and the warmer 7B along Chesapeake Bay to the east. For cool season turf grasses, Virginia Tech recommends tall fescue or the mixture of Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue. It suggests that tall fes fine fescue and perennial ryegrasses are good for the most northern part of the Piedmont and the mountain zone. For the warm season turf grasses, Virginia Tech recommends either zoysia grass or Bermuda grass. Now you might say, well, what about St. Augustine grass? Well, they recommend that St. Augustine can be grown in Virginia's more Southern and warmer regions. Those are below Richmond. So as you can see, there's no real perfect turf grass for our immediate area. Cool season turf grasses like humid conditions with cool 60 to 70 degree air temperatures while warm season turf grasses grow best in hotter temperatures, but are brown all winter because it's too cool. So the choice of cool or warm season turf grasses largely depends upon the look you want. So let's talk a little bit about the biology. Dr. Mike Goatley uses this slide to help clarify the growth characteristics for each of these turf grasses. The season is shown across the horizontal axis and the growth is shown on the, on the vertical axis. The red line depicts the shoot growth and the blue dotted line depicts the root growth. The blue dashed arrow line depicts the sugar levels and that relates to photosynthesis. Starting in winter, 
The red line shows medium shoot growth and the blue dotted line shows rising root growth. You'll notice that in the yellow bar. The shoot growth continues to rise in the spring. As air temperatures climb above 75 into our 90 plus degree hot summer temperatures, both shoot and root growth are at their yearly low. This explains why season turf grasses, while cool season turf grasses turn a little brown in summer. They are in their stressful, slow season because of the heat. Now you can help your lawn get through this summer stress by raising your mower to its highest setting and to mow roughly three and a half to four inches high and use a sharp mower blade. Water deeply one, one inch per week and that's best done in one watering. Mow and only remove one quarter of the grass, one third of the grass blade, but leave that blade on the lawn. If you mow too low, you stress turf grass at its lowest growth cycle. It's weak in the state. Stress turf grass invites the always present bacteria, virus, and fungi, as well as those insects, to establish a foothold from which the turf grass cannot respond quickly. As the temperatures cool, the grasses resume growing and reach a sustained period of growth in the fall. Notice that in the green bar. Note that this, grass all, this graph also explains why the fall is the best time for rejuvenating or establishing a new lawn. So what about the warm season turf grasses? You'll notice the graph is the same and you'll see that the warm season turf grass, the medium growth is in the winter and the early spring with a dip in the root growth in sugars in the spring. That's the circled area. In the summer through the fall, you can see high growth in sugars, roots, and shoots, which then fall in the winter. That's the green bar. This graph depicts while warm season turf grasses are dormant, that is brown, for four to five months of the year, late fall, winter, and spring, and they're green all summer. So in our mid-Atlantic region, researchers from Virginia Tech, Virginia State University, and the University of Maryland are working together, and they pull their data from their individual turf test farms. Now the background of this slide shows the patches of a turf farm where they grow different varieties of both cool and warm season turf grasses. By using these pooled data, each university releases its report and identifies the various varieties of grasses in two categories. First, the recommended grass varieties, and these must perform well over three or more years. Second, the promising varieties, which perform well for a minimum of two years. So as an example, the 2021 report issued by Virginia Tech lists 14 varieties of Kentucky bluegrass and over 50 varieties of tall fescue in their recommended category. That's a lot of data to think about. But fortunately for Virginia gardeners, the Virginia Crop Improvement Association certifies grass blends that follow these recommendations. In short, this certification allows gardeners an ability to differentiate among the seed offerings. We know that some garden centers take this to an even higher level and blend certified seed specifically for the best performance of their customer area. Bottom line, purchase certified seed or turf. Just like other garden products, Seeds are labeled. And so if you read the label, you can see what the grass seed is called, what the grass constituents are in the bag, that's number two, whether there are other impurities, that's three, four, five, and six. And here I'll say that Virginia State takes a really hard look at noxious weeds 
and has a list by regulation that cannot be in these grass mixtures. You can see the origin of the seed, and then you can see the lot to trace the, that seed if you have any problems with it. Also, you can see how often it will germinate. In this case, it's 85% germination. Well, you might say, what about other things? What about those shady areas? And shady areas are about four hours or less of sun. So in this, this year in Master Gardener College, we heard a terrific talk from Rod Simmons, Natural Resources Manager for the City of Alexandria. And Mr. Mr. Simmons covered native alternative lawns. He recommended poverty grass and parasol sedge, as well as the native sedge, Carex Pennsylvanica. And all of these are grass options. All of these are low growing grass like plants and they require mowing only once or twice per season and once in the fall to winterize the yard. Other experts suggest putting ground cover for those shady areas. Let's take a look at these three grasses. First, poverty oak grass is a clumping grass with dense tufted foliage. It likes mineral soils and those are soil so that I have a lot of sand and rock and it will tolerate some foot traffic. Parasol sedge, it's a native perennial that grows in a clump and also likes mineral sandy to rocky soils and it grows low only one to six inches. And our native Pennsylvania sedge slowly spreads underground by rhizomes and above ground by stolons. It likes acid woodland soil that is well drained and can be mowed two, three inches to mimic a lawn. It will tolerate some moderate traffic. So the choice is yours, warm season or cool season. And for shady areas, we have some grass-like options that look like turf, but, and we also have some ground covering choices. Bottom line, all turf grasses and plantings have a growth cycle. Awareness of and working within those cycles takes planning and work. So your plant of choice for your yard can look its best throughout the year. And with that, I'll give you some resources that will help if you want to do more research. Gardener Ann, I recall yes. the yard of my youth was full of clover with white flowers that attracted bees. I've heard that some experts are now encouraging homeowners to add clover to their lawns. What's the latest on adding clover? Well, like you, Linda, I had a clover yard when I was growing up. And one of the reasons why clover was so tolerated back in my youth was because it fixated um, nitrogen in the, around the rhizomes in the soil. What we see is the benefit of clover is the most fugitive of, of our minerals can look at uh, fixed nitrogen in the soil. And microclover is now what people are researching. Now, microclover is a variant of that larger clover that we had in our youth. But clover, microclover differs because it has very small leaves and flowers and without the annoying clumps of growth of its larger cousin. With these appealing characteristics, university experts from Virginia Tech, Pennsylvania State, and the University of Maryland are working together to research the benefits of adding microclover into our mixtures of our turf grasses. Well, so far they've seen that they report five to 10% clover by weight added to the mixture of Kentucky bluegrass and fescue seed provides a good balance. But their research also shows that, that microclover also grows well in full sun. Now they see that microclover takes over chewing fescue and hard fescue. So that is not a good option. 
So if gardeners want to add microclover to the yard, then they'll have to choose herbicides that will eliminate the other broadleaf weeds, but not their desired microclover. So the researchers have gone ahead and said that they've looked at the selective herbicide, 2-methyl, 4-chlorophenoxyacetic acid, or MCPA for short, has a minimal effect on clover, but it will control those other unwanted broadleaf weeds. So while the research is going on, it will be up to the homeowners to determine whether they will accept the look of a little bit of clover mixed up in their yards in exchange for the many benefits of nitrogen retained in their soil. And here I will give you some additional resources about microclover. So thanks for that question, Linda, but let's now turn to the weeds of the week. So Gardener Linda, what weed are you bringing to us today? Thank you, Gardener Linda. I mean, thank you, Gardener Ann. Uh, it's been a very hot and dry July followed by a wet August. These are favorable conditions for the growth of the weed that I'll be discussing. Ground ivy, Glaucoma heteroacea. It is a broadleaf weed also known as creeping charlie. It is a common non-native perennial originally from Europe. It is an evergreen summer weed, which means the foliage persists and stays green throughout the year. It thrives in a shady, moist areas, but can tolerate full sun in areas where the turf grass has thinned out due to the hot, dry summer. This can easily invade our home lawns and can quickly crowd out turf grass. So true to its name, it creeps along the soil surface and forms roots where the leaves join the stem. This creeper is a member of the mint family, Lamaacea. It has a distinct odor when crushed. It's a square stem characteristic of the mint family and like its mint relatives, it is an aggressive grower. It forms a low growing mat of stems stolen and leaves across the ground, which quickly reproduces by creeping stems. It's called stoloniferous growth from the mother to the daughter plant that root at each node. The leaves are opposite and round, kidney shaped, broad, rounded and scalloped edges. Its flowers are purple, blue, violet. They are tube shaped and occur in clusters of two to three from March till June. The seeds are reproduced from April till June and begin germination immediately. Like the true ivy, this plant remains green throughout the year unless with severe frost. So how do we control it? It is a difficult weed to control in our home lawns. It requires a long-term integrated management strategy. In most cases, conditions favorable for ground ivy are not favorable for our vigorous turf grass. The combinations of shade, wet soils, poor fertility, stack things up against the turf in favor of the ground ivy. So good cultural practices for a healthy lawn will encourage thick, dense, and healthy turf grass that can compete and prevent weed establishment. These include aeration, overseeding, top dressing, fertilizing, and watering turf grass properly in the mornings. Also cutting the lawn with a sharp mower blade. The plants will then be less susceptible to diseases and the proper mowing height of three and a half to four inches. Retaining and mulching the glass, grass clippings puts nutrients back into your lawn and adds organic matter, which improves soils, especially in our, our Virginia clays. Additionally, you can consider trimming your trees that will increase the sunlight to your lawn. All these will encourage vigorous growth of your turf and give your lawn the competitive edge over weeds such as ground ivy. Mechanical controls. Hand pulling may be possible with young plants in the spring 
are in the beginning of infestation. If the area is shady and moist, consider replacing the shade with shade tolerant ground cover plants, such as the ones Anne previously mentioned, or mulch your area. In our yard, ground ivy proliferated due to the hot and dry July followed by the wet August. These conditions stressed and thinned our turf grass and enabled ground ivy to thrive. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been, it's been easy for me to go into my lawn and pull the ground ivy runners up from my lawn and simply drop them into my weed bucket. Chemical, chemical control. Herbicides are our last result. Spot or wide area tree with a selective post emergent product considering containing the active ingredients dicambra, triclipper, or penoxalum. Always be cautious when handling and using a herbicide. Before using any chemical herbicides, read the label completely and follow all manufacturer's directions carefully. Ground ivy frequently grows in the shade of trees or shrubs. In these areas, spray only to wet the leaves of the ground ivy and make sure not to soak the ground to avoid the uptake of the herbicide by the roots of any woody plants. Do not spray during the hot or windy weather to avoid herbicide drifting onto your desirable plants. First treatment of ground ivy should be in the spring, early to mid-April through mid-May. If ground ivy are present and have not been killed by a severe frost. However, in late May or June, the seeds have germinated and the weeds may start proliferating. If the Daytime temperatures are climbing into the mid 80s and higher, you will have to wait until the fall, like late September, when the daytime temperatures are in the 60s or, set or low 70s to treat with a herbicide. In the fall, the weeds are moving energy reserves to the roots in preparation for winter dormancy and present, present a good time to treat them. Choose a day when no rain is in the forecast for 48 hours following your chemical application. Since ground ivy is hard to kill, expect to treat repeatedly regardless of the product you use. Again, read the product label carefully to determine the application rate and the reapplication schedule if needed. So Gardner Linda, aren't there similar similar things that look like Creeping Charlie out there? How do I know right. between Creeping Charlie and something else? Gardner Ann, you're right. There are a couple similar plants to ground ivy, aka Creeping Charlie. These plants are mallow and hembit. Mallow, Malava neglecta is a rosette growing plant. It, all of its leaves emanate from a central point or crown, and each leaf has its own stem. It has an alternate leaf arrangement versus the opposite that ground ivy has. This plant has a tap root versus the stolons and runners that are along the ground surface of ground ivy. It is a summer or winter annual versus the perennial evergreen. Another similar plant is henbit. Lamellum amplux is a proscate growth. It has purple to pink flowers in the spring. It has a square stem like ground ivy, so it's a member of the mint family. And the leaves are opposite like ground ivy, but they're short and tight. The leaf edge is ser heavily serrated versus the round scalloped edge of the ground ivy. And the, it is a winter annual versus a, a perennial evergreen. Hembit dies in the hot, dry weather in late May and June. If you want more information on Hembit, tune into our next lunch and lawn session on Wednesday, 23 September.
And the next slide is um, my references. So it's uh, Penn State, Virginia Tech, and Rutgers. Gardner, Linda, that was terrific. Now I've been really struggling with Creeping Charlie and I noticed one of the questions that came in by one of our participants during registration, we're both really looking for how can we get rid of this Creeping Charlie once and for all and permanently. In my case, it's mixed in with my herbaceous and woody peonies, my black-eyed Susans, and my tiger lilies. So do you have any suggestions for me? The story that you tell me is, sounds really dire, like I'm stuck with this guy. Any suggestions? Well, Gardner Ann, ground ivy is very aggressive and difficult to eradicate, especially from your ornamental flower bed. Pull the young plants when they first appear in the spring. If your flower bed is dry, you could moisten the area and make it easier to hand pull. I would not spot treat the area with a herbicide since their ornamental plantings could be potentially damaged or killed if the roots soak up the herbicide. That's my recommendation is to continue what you've been doing by weeding several times a year. Be diligent. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, boy, that sounds like I still have to get down on my hands and knees and do a lot of work. So thank you for thank that, Gardner Linda. And now over to you, Gardner Miriam. What are you bringing us today? Uh, thank you, Gardner Ann. Uh, I am going to be discussing yellow nut sedge, Cyperus esculentis. Uh, nut sedge is a crest of spreading ability coupled with its resistance to eradication make this warm season perennial a notoriously difficult weed, one of the worst in turf management. Identification of nut sedge, which is a sedge and not a grass, is usually not difficult. The five to seven inch long, one third inch wide, glossy light green leaf blades have a conspicuous channel along the late leaf vein of each blade. The leaves are clustered at the base of a triangular stem in groups of three, a structure and arrangement typical of the sedge family. Yellow nut sedge is similar in appearance to Kalinga brevifolia, but Kalinga is much shorter, about two to six inches and it also has no tubers. For more information on Kalinga, you may view the first session of Lunch and Lawn on August 12th, posted on the fairfaxgardening.org YouTube channel. Gardener Miriam, I've heard there is a purple variety. What's the difference between yellow and purple nut sedge? Yes, there is a purple nut sedge. It has much in common with yellow nut sedge, including aggressive spread and resistance to control. Both produce tubers, with purple nut sedge producing tubers in a chain configuration. Uh, purple nut sedge thrives in damp conditions uh, similar to yellow nut sedge. Yellow nut sedge is distributed across all states while purple nut sedge prefers a tropical to warm climate uh, and is not found as extensively in northern climates. The leaves, as you can see in the picture there, uh, of purple nut sedge are darker green and thinner than yellow nut sedge. Uh, the yellow flowers of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the flowers of purple nut sedge are purple to reddish brown. Uh, purple nut sedge is also more resistant to herbicides than yellow nut sedge. Nut sedge produces a yellowish brown loose cluster of flowers that resemble a spiky grass head sitting atop a 12 to 24 inch stem. Seed production from this spike accounts for some of this plant spread, but most reproduction is by underground tubers that are also called nutlets. And in this picture, you can see the below ground structure of uh, yellow nut sedge. Uh, the tubers or nutlets arise from the tips of the rhizomes of the nut sedge plant. 
Uh, and it just to refresh your memory, a rhizome is an underground stem. Each nut sedge uh, plant can produce hundreds of tubers each spring, with new plants arising from the tubers six to eight weeks later. Tubers can persist underground for decades, making control very difficult. Control of yellow nut sedge requires careful thought and persistence on the part of the homeowner. Because yellow nut sedge thrives in high moisture, sunny conditions, adequate drainage and proper irrigation practices can go a long way to helping with the management of this weed. And pulling young plants before tuber production can prevent growth, growth of new plants. As always, good turf management practices to maintain dense, healthy turf always help with management of yellow nut sedge. However, uh, yellow nut sedge can outcompete turf in almost any growing conditions and can tolerate shade and dry soils once it's established. Now, as far as uh, chemical controls, um, fertilization is uh, recommended in the fall only for your lawn. And this, this is to uh, prevent or to promote the growth of yellow nut sedge. That will help uh, because its growth ceases once in the fall. Chemical control with post-emergent herbicides around early June um, and application before temperatures exceed 90 degrees is recommended. The goal is to kill the leaves to prevent photosynthetic products carbohydrates from supporting tuber growth. The following are suggested herbicides, bentazone, halosulfuron, imazequin, and imazequin is for warm season turf only, and sulfantrazone. Almost all of these will require, will require more than one application. Always read the label for appropriate application information and instructions. And these are the resources on yellow nut sedge that I used. Uh, it was a very interesting weed, so I, I read a lot about it. It was fascinating, actually. Um, Garden Marion, that was fascinating. I, I have nut sedge in my yard, and my neighbors also have it in their yard. We have cool season yards, and I would like to have a spot herbicide that I can get rid of this, this weed that just pops up and grows way taller than my turf grass. Do you have any suggestions for me? Well, typically, uh, before the development of these more targeted herbicides, uh, they, they, it's just a general type. Uh, a non-specific herbicide was used. Uh, but of those ones that I listed, halosulfuron is the most selective for sedges. Um, and it's very interesting. It targets a specific enzyme in a metabolic pathway that is unique to nut, nut sedge, yellow nut sedge. So it makes it very specific. Uh, the other herbicides don't as, as with this one, as with halosulfuron, they don't uh, target turf, which is very good. But it is that specificity, uh, which is really nice, that you can kind of zero in in a spot application manner and get rid of this yellow nut sedge. Well, thank you, Gardner Miriam. That's hopeful news for me. And thank you both for your, your weed of the week. Now let's turn to our, our participants for the questions that they've asked when they did the registration. Um, Joe sent along a picture of his backyard and he had a whole series of questions. And so we've used his picture to help anchor all of the questions that we received for this week. And the first one is what can I do about my yard? So his first question was really about when 
do you, when should he start renovating his yard? Gardner Ann, thank you. I'll take that question. Now is the best time to reseed your yard. And here's a maintenance calendar by Dr. Mike Goatley and others from Virginia Tech. The X indicates the preferred timing, so seeding, overseeding from mid-August through mid-October. Also, now is the time to apply fertilizer and pre-emergent for the fall uh, applications targeting annual bluegrass and winter broadleaf, as well as post-emergent. Uh, thus, it is important to properly identify your weeds and selecting the appropriate control strategies. And lastly, a plot, you can go out and rake your lawn and rake up all the dead turf and do that between mid-September and mid-November. I see we have another question about uh, the order and renovating the lawn. It was submitted by Joe, Nazarene, and Paul. Well, the very first thing you should do is to get or do a soil test. And you should do that every three years. And you can find soil tips at your local library. You can collect your sample and mail it to Virginia Tech and they'll do an analysis for a cost of, of $10. For more information on the importance of, of doing a soil test and how to, con how to do a soil test, check out our YouTube site uh, of our second session of Lunch and Lawn that was held on 26 August. And Gardner Al's motto was, know your pH and don't guess. So again, it's very important to do a soil test and do that every three, three years. So the optimal pH for your turf grass is somewhere between 6.2 and seven. If it's too low or too acidic, then add some lime to increase pH, but only add in increments of 50 pounds per thousand square feet. And if you need more than a second application within 30 days. The second thing you should do is aerate and overseed, and those can be done at the same time, then followed by a top, top dress with fine compost. And lastly, fertilize your new grass after you have mowed it at least two times. Thanks, Gardner Linda. So our next question was about continuing along with all the steps. Um, when do you do the aeration and how do you do it? And this was asked by Nicole. Well, it, you, the aeration is kind of like a lawnmower, but it has hollow tubes that are tines that dig into the grass and pull up a plug of, of soil and, and grass. The best time to do this is after you've got your soil slightly damp. You don't want wet soil because you'll compact the earth. But damp soil will allow the aerator times to penetrate down into the soil. And the day before you do the aeration, um, mow your lawn shorter and collect your clippings. This is an exception to the leave the clippings on the grass. You want to collect the clippings because you want to have get rid of all of the um, barriers that will prevent your seed from reaching the soil. You need to have good seed soil contact for that new grass to grow. Virginia Tech recommends that you aerate in two directions. So in one direction and then perpendicular in another direction. And leave the plugs on your lawn after aeration. That, that soil that's been removed with the plugs will help your, um, will eventually migrate into the soil and enrich the soil. Now the next question related to that also, and that is, as Linda said, the next step is top dressing. So Joe and Nazreen asked, what is top dressing? Well, it's just fine textured compost. Um, and the technique for doing this is you get, whether you get it in a bulk or you get it in a uh, bags, you take and you usually need a wheelbarrow, a shovel, 
Um, you take, you put the soil on the ground and you rake it across your soil. You don't want to bury the grass that's already there. Your goal is one quarter to one inch on top of the soil so that you have good seed contact with the soil. So our next question is about some more um, herbicides. Now, Gardener Miriam, I think you're our, yes. our gal for that. Yes. Um, now, typically with any herbicide, uh, it's important to read the product label as, as Linda has emphasized, especially in her talk. Um, so, uh, you know, as an example, if you're using the herbicide tenacity, um, you, with uh, tall fescue in Kentucky bluegrass or ryegrass, you can overseed immediately after application of this particular herbicide. Um, with fine fescue, if you have that growing, you need to wait two to four weeks before overseeding. And again, uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of reading and following the label instructions on an herbicide. Now, uh, this is a question about pulling out the dead weeds after you use a, um, an herbicide. And you, you don't have to. Uh, you can leave them there prior to aerating or overseeding and fertilizing. Uh, but as Ann mentioned, you want to mow and rake grass clippings prior to aerating and overseeding. Um, and again, this is the exception to what is usually recommended, which is to leave clippings. Uh, there is no need to remove these old dead weeds. You can, there is no harm in doing that. Uh, there are occasionally, but not often, residual weed seeds that you might be able to pick up by pulling these out. Um, but it, again, it's not necessary. Uh, the timing of the seeding, of the new grass depends on herbicide used. Wait the manufacturer's recommended time before seeding. And again, follow those label instructions regarding this. And uh, the timing for the fertilizer application, you want to uh, wait until you have uh, mowed the new, the new grass at least two times. Thanks, Gardner Miriam. And I see that there was a question from the chat that really asked about that timing of the fertilization. So you want to wait for the, the new grass to have grown and been mown twice and then do your fertilization. And as I heard uh, one of you say earlier in our dis discussion, you want to wait in, in the fall is the best time to fertilize, not in the spring. Right. I'm going to open up the, the questions. Do we have any questions from the audience at this point? I think we have a time for one question. Okay, after this session is over, I'll go back. There was a request to go back to the shade slide and I'll do that after we finished. So we, this is, as we mentioned earlier, the third of our six theories on the luncheon lawn. And this is specifically focused on lawn care and weeds. Our next session is on September 23rd and Gardner Al and his team will be talking about maintaining equipment, the grass, the weeds, will be Bermuda grass and henbit. And we want to thank you for attending this lunch and lawn. We want to also say that our website, fairfaxgardening.org, has the weed facts that you can see here. And all of the weeds that we've been discussing in this lunch and lawn have fact sheets that are separately available in our, our website. In addition, a number of times we've mentioned our YouTube. If you'll look at looking at the VCE Fairfax County YouTube, and if you'll enter that into your browser, you'll see that we have all of the webs, all of the videos for 
this Lunch and Lawn series, but also for our virtual plant series. And there's a lot of great information that's, that's out there. So we wanna thank you for attending this session and join us again, September 23rd. Thanks everybody. And, and I'll now go back to um,